from Princeton, from Yale, from Columbia, from Imperial, from Oxford. It could be scarcely more pre prestigious and completely autonomous scientists endorsing it. I'm a historian. It would be extraordinary for me to class <laughs> guys. Sorry. I, I meant both, actually, both the science and the, and, and the procedures that have been followed. Because one of the things you've uh, said in your memorandum uh, is that you indicated that the Information Commission said that there's no breach of the law has been established. But the letter from the Commission states the prima facie evidence from the published emails indicates an attempt to defeat disclosure by deleting information. It's hard to imagine a more clear-cut or cogent prima facie uh, piece of evidence, isn't it? And yet you have taken the opposite view. You've supported the science. I accept the fact you're not a scientist. Yes, I mean, if the science is but such you, a... you've also a... supported the, the administrative process. process. Well, and well, that's rather prejudging it. Well, 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 may I comment? Because I am rather puzzled about the um, statement from the ICO. Because, as I understand it, our, our principle is that prima facie evidence is evidence which, on the face of it and without investigation, suggests there is a case to answer. To my mind, there's prima facie evidence. Why did I set up the Muir Russell Independent Review? Prima facie evidence is not the same as you have been found to breach. So, I, I mean, you explained it to me, if you would. I'm very puzzled. If it's subjudicate, if, as we had in a letter 10 days ago from the ICO, the investigation hasn't even begun, I, I, I'm just sort of puzzled. How, how could we have been found to breach if there's been no investigation? No, but that's not what you said, actually. You didn't say that this is yet to be judged. What you said, it's, it's the state indicated that no breach of the law has been established. Yeah. That, that's you prejudging the well, case. No, it? it hasn't been established. Well, unless there's been an investigation. But I well, wouldn't it have been better to say that? Well, I've tried to rather succinctly. But uh, uh, to establish is to have done an investigation. Can, can, I, can I ask you a more general question yes. about uh, the, your attitude to it, which I was perhaps not very successfully trying to get at with the analogy with our problems in this place with the speaker. Yeah. Shouldn't you be actually delighted that all these emails have been released? Isn't on one of the most sci important scientific issues of our age, isn't it really important that we have as much information out there as possible? It is, and I would think that one should go well beyond the Freedom of Information Act. The issue is so important, and also once it is in the minds of some people, once they imagine there's a conspiracy to distort, then any refusal of information, even if it's nothing to do with data, but private emails or commercial agreements, will feed that. So I'm longing for it to be completely open. But uh, whether it's a good thing the emails are um, thrown open like that, I, I wait to judge. That there'll be much more public debate, I delight in. And I thoroughly agree with that. I'm anxious if the effect of the way in which it's reported is, is disinformation and sort of hint about something where there's absolutely nothing hidden. It's, it's in a way the most deeply confirmed and affirmed the major issue of the temperature graph from about 1850. The early medieval period, we should be spending more money on the research. But the, the latter is so overly endorsed by scientists. I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled that we should welcome um, a sort of um, savouring of, of doubt where scientists tell us that there is no doubt. Can, can you tell us how you came to choose some of your to run this inquiry? I, I took counsel from very senior um, figures, uh, including those in higher education, about somebody who would have knowledge of university life, real experience of public life, and command enormous respect for their integrity, preferably who I'd never met. And Muir Russell was the top name that came to mind, and I was delighted when he agreed to do it. Thank you. Can I go back to Professor Jones? Uh, I don't want to repeat uh, the previous uh, exchange we had, but I, I just would like to be clear in terms of the answers to the questions of to Doug and, and Evan about the repeatability of uh, the works you put out. You're saying very clearly that on a lot of the papers you put out. Other scientists, not that they need your, your working books, but they can't uh, repeat those, that work when those papers are, are published. Um, 
because they don't have the programs and the and they the They haven't codes. got the programs or the or, or, right. or the data. Right. So so they can't without that. But that's just a fact of life in the in the climate right. sciences. Right. That's very clear. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Graham Cummings has made uh, a number of points that it appeared that your organisation, writing the, the different codes that it did, didn't adhere to the standards one might find in professional software engineering, and that the code had easily identified books, he himself claims to have identified books in the programmes, even after the BBC2 uh, programme, and that there's no test, no visible test uh, method was. Uh, uh, apparently uh, used, and they're poorly documented. I, I, is that true? I, is uh, Dr. Graham coming right? Those codes are for a much earlier time. They're from the period about 2000 to 2004. <coughs> and the, um, the codes that were stolen uh, were earlier, and we have we've have, uh, people working on these at the moment, trying to do some other work. And they, but they don't relate to the production of the, of the Global and Hemispheric Temperature Series. Nothing to do with that. They're to do with a different project. Well, can you tell us which project they were to do with? So it's clear to us. Um, they have to do with a project that was funded by the British Atmospheric Data Centre, which is run by the uh, NERC. And that was to produce a uh, more uh, gridded temperature data and precipitation data and other variables. And a lot of that has been released on a on a Dutch website and also on the BADC website. So have you now released the, the code, the actual code used uh, for Crew 10-3? Uh, the Met Office have. They've released their version. Well, have you released our, your version? We haven't yet? released our yeah. version, but it produces exactly the same result. So you haven't released your version? We haven't released our version, but I can assure you... But it's different? So it's different, because the Met Office version is written in a computer language called Perl, and they wrote it independently of us and ours is written in, uh, in Fortran. And how do you respond to the suggestion that you mingled confidential data with open data? And consequently, that, that's the reason you, you refused a lot of the requests for information. Um, that's, that's how it is, because we've got data coming in routinely, and we've added in this extra data where we try to get extra data for certain regions of the world. According to Mosher and Fuller, uh, when you were asked to name, and Professor Acton's named a number of other countries that you've had confidential agreements with now, they said that you could only produce uh, the names of three countries. Is that, is that right when you were asked? I think it was about five. Right. And since the data has been released, has there been any legal action taken against you? Uh, no. Did you try to get round the agreements you've made with, with these different countries in the interests of scientific objectivity? Uh, not in that way. We did, with, with, with the help of the Met Office, approach all the countries of the world and ask them whether we could release their data. And uh, we've had 59 replies, of which 52 have been positive. And so that has led to the release of 80% of the data. Uh, but we have had these seven um, negative responses, of which we talked about earlier with Canada. Right. Just the, the final question, which I don't like Ian, is the, it's the nub of uh, the issue. I don't think you can read the emails or the responses to the Freedom of Information requests without coming to the view that you didn't want people to have this information. Doesn't that have the, one, doesn't it breed distrust? And secondly, doesn't it exclude newcomers? And, and why, why weren't you keen for people to have this information? We're not ex excluding anybody. We were making the derived product available and, and the series. So those data were available on our website. What wasn't there was the raw station data. Yeah. But doesn't that, that, that... I will repeat it one more time. I'll, I'll shut up, Joe. But that does exclude checking. And it does rather put you as a scientist above interested uh, scientists who want to check on them. It puts you above... Uh, it's the United States, it's the Department of Energy that funds you, isn't it? Mm. It, it puts you above uh, people uh, who have paid their tax dollars to fund you because they can't check the work you're doing. No, but they can get access to all the data on these other websites. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay. Could, can I just ask you briefly before I, I, I pass on to Dr. Harris to the last of these questions? We're overrunning slightly on this, but it's, I think you appreciate it, and um, it, it's an important session. Um, 